There we go. He is one of the brightest minds in basketball that we've seen in a while. In fact, I wonder if coach is a term that should be applied to him. Should it be miracle worker? Because he's known to turn teams and programs around. Yet, if you know this man, accolades and titles, while they're nice, they're good. They don't mean much to him because for him, what happened in the past is the past and it's about moving forward. It's about nailing one more title. It's about leading one more team up basketball stairway to heaven. Well, I guess uh, what hasn't been said about this man? Without further ado, my guest on Cold Brew, none other than Coach Tab Baldwin. Coach, good evening. Good evening, Rick. How are you? Great to be with you, by the way. <laughs> well, it's always great to see you, Coach. And you're looking lean. Are you losing weight by design? I hope you're... You're not starving, are you? <laughs> no, no, I probably should. But uh, no, actually, you know, this, this pandemic, Rick, has been a tragedy for a lot of people. And, right. and we all know that, you know, it's put many, many people into very, very difficult circumstances. But, you know, I have to say that, that for me, it's been a, I, I don't want to say a welcome break, but it's certainly been a break. And it's given me one thing that probably over the last, 30 years I haven't had much of, and that was time, and that is time. And I've tried to use that time well. I've, I've been very strict with my diet. I've done exercise like I haven't exercised in a long time, and I've actually lost about almost 25 pounds. So I'm probably in the best shape I've been in in probably 30 years. So I feel great. I feel great. Well, I should take your lead, Coach, because I am overweight, right? So... I look good, Rick. You look good. <laughs> anyway, um, on Cold Brew tonight, we've got Coach Tom Baldwin. And it's not just going to be about basketball. I think there's one thing you, you should know about Coach. He is a multifaceted man. Everyone just knows the basketball aspect about him. But there's much, much more. And we're going to try to sift through that so you'll see that the other dimensions to this human being right in front of me who I am proud to call friend. But... Everyone is waiting for the Ateneo basketball discussion, and we're going to lead off with that. Before I ask you about how the team is doing, I need to ask this. Jones Cup, with about, what, five, six seconds left to play. Taipei is leading. We've got the ball in our own side of the court. There's an inbound by 30 Ravenna. Was that the play? Was it executed to perfection, coach? Yeah, it was pretty much actually. Um, you know, I was really proud of the boys, and it's a play that that we had worked on in practice, so it wasn't you know uh, designed in the moment. Uh, but we did have the time out to remind everybody of their of their uh, responsibilities, and um, and you know Taiwan just they bit on the decoy cut by Jolo Mendoza, and when you bite on that cut, all you need after that is uh, your screener, who was Isaac Go in that situation. And right. a good pass from 30 Ravenna, you just need them to do their jobs and then Matt's got to hit the shot. So, you know, it all, it all depended on the bite, on the decoy cut. And after that, the others did their job and Matt hit the shot. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, of course, the players felt pressure in the moment because, you know, they want to win every game. But for me, I was, I was just happy they executed. And, um, and, you know, it was a lot of fun. If we had missed the shot, you know, I would have been okay because it was a good performance against the national team. And you know, I was right. pretty proud of the boys. So the win was sort of icing on the cake. Okay. Um, you said that you had run it in practice. How often were they able to execute that in practice? And I never saw you run that play in the UAP or any other league, Coach. No, I don't think we, you know, I don't think we had that particular circumstance. So that's a play, uh, among a few others, that we would run with sort of, less than a second and a half and eat needing a three or you know if you want to go for the win and not the tie uh you know you shoot the three but we would probably run those last second plays you know it, when we're in competition we'll run them maybe once a week mm -hmm. um just so that they're in our heads um in the off season we don't run them very much so um we probably hadn't run that particular play in quite some time because Jones right. Cup was kind of an off-season right. tournament. But uh, it was in the players' heads. All right. Whenever I watch that play or even that game or most 
games where you call the shots, I don't see you with a lot of emotion. What's up with that? How are you able to keep a lid on that emotion with everyone going bananas, going nuts, especially in that moment? Well, that's not my job to be emotional. In fact, if I'm emotional, I'm probably not doing my job. So um, I don't get paid to celebrate or, you know, languish or admonish or uh, cry or, or anything like that. You know, I, I get paid to do my job and my job is to be in the moment. And, um, you know, that's something that over a 40 year career, you, you, you know, I wasn't always like that for sure. But, uh, you know, I think that I'm, I'm able to um, detach myself for the most part. Sometimes the referees get to me a bit, you know, and, and yeah, that it's, gets it's a bit frustrating. But uh, even that sometimes is, is uh, emotion for effect rather than real emotion. So right. um, I'm happy for the boys in those moments, you know, and for myself, it's just doing my job. I'm curious, before we continue with Ateneo basketball, were you like that as well during the Olympics? <laughs> yeah, I think I was. I think I was. I, I think by the time the 2000s rolled around, um, I had gone through with a very, very mature basketball team. I'd gone through several championship seasons in New Zealand. And that had taught me through, through this group of very mature players, you know, how to stay in the moment. And um, I mean, you know, it's not 100 percent. Even today, it's still not 100 percent. Mm. But I, I think um, it's probably been one of my strengths is <clears throat> don't get carried away with the moment. And I don't want my players to get carried away with the moment either. But they're obviously much younger and much less experienced. So I, I expect that of myself. And, and I think that, yeah, for the most part, I think I've achieved that. Right. Speaking of in the moment, Coach, with the ongoing pandemic, there are challenges with regards to practicing. Do you feel that the lack of activity, I know that they're doing individual training, strength and conditioning, but this time, does it dull the Ateneo Blue Eagles edge? No question. Absolutely no question. You know, we, we have lost <clears throat> an incredibly important phase of our training program, our individual training. It's not to say we won't recover some of it, but that will depend on when they project, you know, that we're actually going to have a season. Um, but, you know, individual training and monitoring that through video, we don't monitor the full training session of every player. We monitor pieces of it here and there. So right. we really depend on our players, you know, to do their individual training correctly. And I'm proud of them. I, I'm seeing good results, mm -hmm. but I have no doubt that, that we're doing probably 50% of the work that uh, we would have otherwise done and, and probably, you know, no more than 60% of the work that we should be doing. So sure. you, you can't recover that by talking about it. Most definitely. The off-season noise has been dominated by LaSalle and even UP in terms of recruiting. And the school, Ateneo is really under the radar, except for the fill it out in the, over the last few days. Uh, without giving anything away, is everything in place for how you project next season or even the seasons to come? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're in great shape, actually, uh, apart from the lost training time. You know, we only graduate one player this coming year. So this was never going to be a heavy recruiting year for us anyway. Um, I, I take an approach to recruiting, recruiting where I don't believe in over-recruiting. I don't believe in signing a player just because he's a good player. If, if it doesn't fit the profile of our roster and what we need at that particular time, then, you know, we have to wish him well and, and allow him to go someplace else that might be a better fit for him at that time. Right. Um, having said that, you know, we do have some, uh, like we've announced also Fortsky, not only the Philip Italian player, you know, Gabe, Gabe uh, Gonzalez, we've also announced Fortsky and, and, you know, we're looking two years down the track at, at some recruiting. So, I think we're going to be talking a bit more about recruits, but um, I think we're in very good shape for uh, our next season with what we've got right now. Right. Um, obviously, the challenge from our neighbors in Diliman as well as in Taft is real. Um, people are asking, like, okay, 
you've lost three guys who can take big shots. That's Isaac, 30, and Matt. I know that you're playing team basketball. At any given time, anyone can score. But who do you see stepping up this coming season? Rick, that's a, you know, that's a great question because, you know, I have to answer that honestly. And it's, and it's an answer. The reason it's a great question is because you don't get the expected answer. Mm -hmm. We do believe that every player has to be prepared to take that shot in that moment. So most of our last second plays are multi-optional anyway. Mm -hmm. And if we're not running a play, if we're in the flow of the game, then we expect good decisions to be made by the players on the floor. And that means find the open man. Mm -hmm. So when you adhere to that philosophy, it means that every player has to have the mentality that it could be them. Mm -hmm. And we want our players, you know, to be ready for that moment. I don't want the player who thinks that moment is about him. And I don't want the player who's hiding from that shot and hiding from that moment. And both exist. Mm -hmm. And both may exist in our program, you know. Yeah. But we talk about that. We want to you know, we want to get rid of that mentality on both sides. And we want our players to understand that games are not won and lost in the last second. And if you have to take that shot, it isn't about you making that shot. Mm -hmm. It's about how that shot is constructed in that moment. But more importantly, it's about what did we fail to do for the prior 39 minutes and 58 seconds right. that lead to that moment that put any one of our players under pressure. And so that's the message that we give our players. And we're consistent with that message. So, you know, for me to say, who do, whose hands do I want the ball in? Look, if, if I have the luxury of calling a play at that time, uh, much like we did with Isaac Go, you know, a lot of people wouldn't expect Isaac to be the guy to take that shot. They might not expect Matt Nieto. They might expect the ball to go to 30's hands or Jolo's hands. But I'm a big believer that a good shot in anybody's hands is a better shot than a bad shot in your best player's hands. Mm -hmm. So we run a lot of decoy action. So whoever we put on the floor that might be the expected go-to guy might be the decoy mm -hmm. in that situation. And mm -hmm. we're looking to get somebody an open shot rather than, you know, our, our supposed best player, maybe a contested tough shot. And that's the opposite of what you'll see in the NBA. In the NBA, they're going to find their go-to guy and let him create the shot, no matter how tough it is. And they're going to live with that. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. don't have NBA talent. So I think what we want is mentally tough players who we can get an open shot for, and anybody's got to be ready to take that shot. Right. And speaking of uh, taking that shot, we're seeing some uh... – some of your players uh, standing up and finally showing their worth. And one of them is William Navarro, who was sort of miscast in San Beda, found a home in Ateneo. In fact, right before he transferred, we met up with his agent. And then I asked him, why do you want to transfer? He said, I want to be coached by Tom Baldwin. What, what does it feel for you, for someone you've never coached, to say something like that? How do you feel about that, Coach? Well, it's flattering, of course. And, um, and, you know, it's something that uh, obviously can be an arrow in the quiver of our program. If, if players out there feel that I might, you know, being coached by me might give them some sort of advantage in their development. And, and you know, you know me, Rick, I'm going to defer to our whole coaching staff. You know, we all do. A, a, we all work hard and I have a very talented coaching staff in terms of developing players. So I, when a player says that, you know, immediately they're saying they want to be coached by our coaching staff. Right. And, um, and, and I think that's a, a great move for most players because I think our coaching staff is uniquely dedicated to the development of the individual rather than the development of the team. Mm -hmm. um, but it is flattering and, and it is something that, you know, certainly over the last several years, I've worked to try and build that reputation among players and among recruits. Um, but also, you know, I'm sure that some of those players, when they actually come under my tutelage, or maybe, maybe they second guess <laughs> that mentality, you know, because we work them really hard. You know, we, we believe that uh, there's just no way 
to approach your potential and, and uh, you know, to strive to be an outstanding basketball player if you don't bleed a little bit, you know, and, and that, that bloodletting is, is through a work ethic which uh, we demand. And we're not nice guys about demanding that. So if, if you're not cut from that cloth, then you should be wary about coming into our program. Right. Speaking of demanding, I was able to talk to CJ Perez. And CJ was saying that had you come in a little earlier, he would have still been in Ateneo. And um, since you've come on board, we've lost no one to academics. Maybe they sat out a year in the case of Graf or Jolo, but no one's gotten kicked out. Um, so what can you talk about in terms of that? How much do you invest in following these kids in terms of their academic progress and making sure they stay in school and they do well? Well, well my job in that, Rick, and, and the job of our coaching staff is, is only to validate the work that Father Nemi and our academic advisors do. You know, there, there's no skirting the academic requirements for our basketball players. They are an Ateneo student just like any others. We do have study halls for them, uh, which are mandatory. But um, beyond that, there are no advantages for our players. And, you know, so all I do is validate the message. And the message comes directly from the president of the university. And we have a new president now, Father Bobby, and, um, and from Father Nimi. It came from Father Jet before, and they demand that it be that way. They demand that our players be student athletes. And um, so all I have to do is, is make sure that I validate that and, you know, give the players, if a player comes to me and says, coach, you know, I have a big exam. I don't think I'm, you know, well enough prepared for it. Is it okay if I miss practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have to trust our players that they don't exploit that in any way and that they actually do go and, and study and prepare themselves for their exams. But um, that is a common occurrence, Rick, in our program. We mm -hmm. even have players who have direct conflicts with practice in class and, and practice comes second every time. Right. So they never ever miss a class to come to practice. Uh, that's just not allowed and, and uh, I wouldn't allow that either. So it isn't hard to do what I do. Sometimes, you know, I miss the players and it, it can be a bit frustrating, but because it is our methodology, it doesn't become something that's frustrating or, or surprising at any, at any stage. You know, we plan for it. We build it into the way that we do things mm -hmm. and, um, and we stick with it and it works. Right. We actually saw that in the Champions League, right, coach? Like, Two years ago, some of our players, you started out with like five players, six players, then became eight players slowly, or players start trickling in. So I guess that's the perfect illustration of how they cannot miss class. They have to get their stuff done in school, right, Coach? Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, anybody that is intimate with our program, they see that. They, they, don't, they don't have to be told. Uh, anybody that talks to the players, the players will give the exact same message because that's their life that they, they live that you know and look the players don't like them I mean, they want to come to practice they, they feel that if they miss practices maybe you know they're going to miss something integral because this happens during the season preseason anytime mm -hmm. they feel they might miss something but it, it's just not something that we are allowed to compromise on so it's not something we ever consider compromising on and and uh, as I said at the end of the day we're all very proud of our players when they, you know, they walk into graduation and uh, they're very, very proud of themselves because the degree that they have earned from Ateneo is a extremely valuable degree and it is incredibly valid because they have done the work. Right. In my introduction, I said that maybe you shouldn't be a coach, but some, you might actually be a miracle worker. And having watched you through the years with different programs all over the world, you've turned things around. Do you like coming into that situation and changing it? And sometimes the results are almost immediate. How are you able to do that, Coach? Because uh, I think you've developed that. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I could be wrong here. But from what I've seen and what I know, you've been able to turn programs around, even previously underachieving countries. 
in terms of their international ball. So what's the secret right there, if you can share it? Well, uh, the, the, the first answer is, is no, I don't prefer that. I would love to walk into a very powerful team and, <laughs> and uh, be highly paid and immediately compete for championships. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I think, you know, perhaps, and you're right, I, you know, I have, I have come into a lot of programs that are in trouble, you might say, and, and they're looking for some sort of solution. And, um, you know, I've been kind of cast in that role. I think ever since, you know, taking New Zealand from obscurity to, you know, the, the heights of a semifinal place in the world champs, it, you know, people started to talk of me in that vein, you know, how do you, how do you take these nobodies and become somebody? Well, first of all, they're not nobodies. They're just, they're just below the radar, but they're outstanding players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it is, it is recognizing the talent that is in these teams, mm -hmm. fostering belief in these teams. And probably my secret ingredient to that is that that's who I was. You know, I was, I was not a talented player. I was the, the baby in the family of five brothers. You know, I was the fifth. So I was, I was the underdog every day of my life. I was being taught lessons and having to fight just for respectability and, and literally find a way, find a way to beat people that were bigger, older, more experienced, and simply better mm -hmm. than me. And so I, I never, you know, I, I never thought about that as, you know, a characteristic, but as you go through a career and you see that sort of, you know, eventuality happen mm -hmm. on multiple occasions, you know, it happened with New Zealand, it happened with Bonvit in Turkey, it happened with Pauk in Greece, it happened with Lebanon, it happened with Jordan, certainly in the FIBA Asia. <clears throat> when, when you, when you experience that, you know, okay, you, you, you know, I have to acknowledge that there is something there, but I, I don't really, you know, I don't really have a formula, but perhaps it is a, you know, a quality of, of my character as a coach and, and um, that's fine, but, you know, gosh, I'd, I'd really rather, you know, have the powerful <laughs> lineup and the powerful team. Uh, and worry about that. Right, right, right. Speaking of powerful teams, well, Ateneo, under your baton, has won 12 or 13 consecutive championships, including the preseason and the offseason. After the last PCCL, I, I bared that fact to you, and you said, really, has it been that many? And so I said, what are your thoughts about it? Hopefully, we can go for number 13. <laughs> That's your answer. Hence, my introduction to you. But... The final question I'll ask you about Ateneo basketball. Does that place more pressure on you? Obviously, the team's going to try and go for four or five beat, you know? You know, I, I'm often asked about pressure. <clears throat> and imagine this. Imagine that, uh, you know, I, I'm doing a metaphor here. Right. Imagine that, that I'm the earth and the pressure is the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. It's it's immense. It's, it's something that um, will kill. Mm -hmm. But we have this thing called an ozone layer mm -hmm. around the earth and it deflects all of that. Right. What deflects all of that for me is the internal pressure that I put on myself. And so I don't feel external pressure. I, I know that it's there. And I acknowledge that, that if I don't succeed, you know, it, it, can, it can mean an end to my job. I, I clearly understand that. Mm. Um, but I don't think that way. I, I think what is required of me to do my job well, what mm. is required of me to assist my players in reaching their potential, what is required of me to build a chemistry in this environment that allows the qualities of my individual players to come together to produce something special as a basketball team. And so my focus stays on that. And there's enough pressure from that, that I don't, I don't have to acknowledge 
you know, the external pressure. I don't have to acknowledge the ultraviolet rays, you know, they're, they're, that's being deflected off of me um, by the fact that I, I stay, you know, introspective about what my job is and how to get it done. Right. There's uh, someone is asking me to ask you this question. How do you feel about having Dave Ildefonso now a part of your program? And I actually asked Dave about it and he said, so how does it feel now to play for Coach Tab? Are you seeing how they stopped you? Then he said, yeah, I'm seeing it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm excited. You know, I, I can tell you, I can tell you, it, it stunned when Dave, you know, decided to go to NU, even though the, the writing was on the wall with, you know, Danny having gone there as a coach, Sean having transferred. We knew that recruitment was going to be extremely difficult and we were not likely to win that recruiting battle, but I was stunned. And I wasn't stunned because he turned us down. I was stunned because of how badly I wanted to coach him and, and how much I, I think of him as a player. And he's also a really fine young man. And, you know, that, that hurt because I, you know, sometimes you come across a recruit and it just seems like, you know, there's a, a click there, there's a chemistry there. And, you know, having Dave in our high school program and, and, you know, being close to him and seeing him every day in the gym and talking to him many, many times. And uh, when, when he finally told me, you know, hey, coach, I, I'm, I'm going to go to NU. You know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't balk from the suggestion that it hurt. It did. It did. And yes, yes, we, we were, when we played against NU, he was right in the crosshairs of our scouting report and our pregame talk and, you know, you talk about putting pressure on some players. I put some heat on some guys to go out and make sure that that his time was going to be miserable. And I wasn't too bashful about reminding him afterwards. And of course, I caught some flack about that. But to me, you know, I'm not the politically correct guy that maybe a lot of people want me to be. I'm a, I'm a vicious competitor. And although I curtail that much of the time in, in my public persona, you know, sometimes it's going to come out. Right. And, and, you know, I thought Dave handled that extremely well because really I was doing nothing than a little bit of trash talking. That's all I was doing. Right. And I thought Dave handled it well. And, um, you know, we've laughed about it a lot since. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way it should be because I, I know if I was, if the roles were reversed and somebody gave me a dig that I deserved, mm -hmm. you know, I would, I would probably you know, want to, want to get on the court and get my due back. But as soon as I saw them, I, you know, there would be a good natured, okay, you got me. And, and that's the way Dave handled it. So huge amount of respect for him. And, um, you know, that's, that's just me. I, I'm not, I'm not going to walk away from competition. And when I lose, I'm coming back hard. All right. And that's just me. So love me or not for that. I don't really care criticize me or not, I don't have thin skin. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have very thick skin. So people can have as many goes at me as they want. They can have as many digs at me as they want. That's okay for me. Um, it's all part of the world that I am. I chose to be in sport. I'm not in some, you know, snowflake uh, feather pillow industry where I can have my feelings hurt by, you know, somebody looking at me. Right, right. No, come, come at me, both barrels. It doesn't bother me in the least. And that's why I'm going to miss all the Nio as a, as a, you know, a side note. I, I, I'm really going to miss him. I'm really going to miss him because he's a tremendous competitor and he's a fighter and he doesn't like me. I think maybe he would like me if we had a chance to be friends, but we're competitors, you know, and he doesn't like me and he, and he, he wants to beat me and I love that. That makes me better. All right. Speaking of another man who's got thick skin, uh, he's a former national coach who preceded you in the Gilas program. We're talking about Raiko Torman. I remember in one of my many conversations with Coach Raiko, he, he said that he's one of the ultimate sports guys. In fact, the moment he gets up, he goes straight to his computer and checks out the latest sports news, not just basketball, but even football and a lot. So I'm curious, Coach, how much of a sports fan are you? What websites do you look at? What games do you care to, to follow? And 
does it make your day? And how, how, how much do you spend online reading all that stuff? Well, I'm a, I'm a different guy than I used to be, to be honest, Rick. I used to be a bit like that. And you say Raiko was thick-skinned. Well, well, he's Serbian, so he doesn't have a choice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and if they're not, they're probably six feet under, just from the, the severity of the, the flack that they would take from their right. countrymen. It's a tough place to go. I've been there. I love it. But I don't think I'm even tough enough to handle those guys. They are, they are really, really tough. <laughs> but anyway, getting back to your question, um, when it comes to coaching, Rick, I'm, I'm a creature of habit. You know, I, I believe in planning and preparation. And um, as you know, I'm, I'm probably identified uh, most obviously by my attention to detail. Mm. When it comes to my personal life, I'm, I'm a little bit the opposite. <laughs> Um, I'm a little bit all over the place. I, I don't have a wake up time. I, I can wake up very early. I can wake up really? so much later. Um, I can get up and I might check the stock market. I might check uh, the political news because I, I follow that very closely, especially in an election year. Um, I might check uh, the game results. You know, that. We, we live in a tempestuous time right now, of course, as you know, uh, yes. with, with all of the issues going on in the world and the pandemic right. and, and uh, the, the unrest in the U.S. And, and uh, I'm a very patriotic guy, Rick. And um, I know that, so yeah. it's, it's been um, a little bit hurtful, a little bit offensive to me to see so many of our athletes in America um, I think disrespecting the flag, disrespecting the national anthem. And so I'm one of those guys that I, I've turned it off. You know, I, I want our sports people to be sports people. And I understand their position and they have every right to do what they're doing, just like I have every right to do what I'm doing. Right. So in the past, I, you know, I absolutely would be checking results and, and um, tuning in, you know, like uh, I like to watch the Red Sox games, you know, if I can, if I can get them, and uh, generally I can, and um, not so much of an NFL fan anymore. I used to be, but just lost interest in it years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but still an NBA fan, still a Major League Baseball fan, and and um, I'm also an NHL fan. I'm a hockey fan. Right, right. But I can't say that I get up and I check ESPN or, you know, um, I just, I kind of read whatever I go through my Facebook posts and a lot of that is sports or sports related and right. uh, politically related. I'll read articles that pop up from, from any source mm -hmm. that pop up there because, you know, my friends on Facebook go across the spectrum of conservative, liberal, libertarian, probably, you know, some anarchists in there too. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I might be one of them. Um, but uh you know, I, I, I think it's important to be informed. Uh, I've read a tremendous amount on the coronavirus. I, I look at the data on that all the time. Um, you know, I want to know, uh, I want to know that when I cast a vote, it's a responsible, informed vote. And because of that, I'm not a headline reader. I, I read, I study, I research. I want to be informed. And yes, right. I have my views, I have my political leanings, uh, but that doesn't dictate how I inform myself. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's very important. My father taught me that a long time ago. Don't read just one newspaper, read a lot of newspapers and be informed. And, um, you know, Sun Tzu in The Art of War said, know thy enemy mm -hmm. uh, as well as you know yourself. So uh, you can't just uh, edify those news outlets that tell you what you like to hear you you have to you have to see everything from every angle in order to be informed and in order to be able to debate and discuss intelligently what's going on in the world today right just for the record coach we all know that your favorite baseball team is the boston red sox how about your hockey team coach boston bruins <laughs> oh there you go boston guy so can we say that you're a New England Patriots fan, Coach? No, I cannot. You know, <laughs> I, I, uh, I am a Celtics fan, 
So I'm, uh, I'm certainly Bruins, uh, Sox, and, and Celts. But uh, I grew up a Cowboys fan. But I was never so married to uh, one NFL team. When I was young, I was. I cried when the Cowboys lost to the Packers in 65 and 66 and all of that era and when I was a little kid. But, you know, later on, as, as I, when I went to University of Notre Dame, I became kind of a Chicago Bears fan. And then I also became a, an Oakland uh, Raiders fan because I, I just loved Al Davis. I loved, mm. um, oh gosh, the coach's name. Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, was it John? Um, we, we should know it, but we don't. But he's yeah. the one that, you know, he had all of these, you know, vicious, vicious guys on defense. You know, Ted Hendricks, Phil Villapiano, Jack Tatum, you know, these guys that would hit just for the sake of hitting. And right. um, I like that. You know, I, I, I like that. It's why I loved rugby when I went to New Zealand and, and I became a big rugby fan and I learned all about that game, and, you know, because I like the physicality. I like the toughness. I like the, you know, the, the adversity of, pain and having to play through pain and uh, right. so yeah I was always drawn to you know the monsters of the midway the bears and and uh, you know the the dirty Oakland Raiders I, I love those teams yeah. <laughs> all right I'm glad you mentioned rugby because I was gonna segue into that what many people do not know is that uh, coach Tab actually during his, in his time in New Zealand also got involved with the rugby program coach you want to tell people about that well it's a it is a pretty interesting story you know I was I was actually on my way out of basketball I was on my way out of coaching basketball um, I had uh, starting in 1995 I had uh, succeeded in in our professional league in New Zealand I had won you know with my team five championships in six years and during that time the national team job came open twice for basketball Mm. And twice I applied and twice I was rejected. And, and uh, at that point, I was, uh, I was a bit hurt. I was a bit, um, you know, and I was an expat, and, uh, you know, but in my heart, I was a New Zealander. But, you know, as it is here sometimes, some people here still see me as, as very much an outsider, even though I feel very much a Filipino, especially when it comes to basketball. You know, I love the country and I love New Zealand. So, you know, I, I, I didn't like the fact that I wasn't given the job. And so I, I became, you know, pretty stubborn and, and uh, I felt like I didn't have that avenue available to me. And mm -hmm. so in 2000, um, I was, I had, I was a big fantasy sports player also back in that day. And, and there you go. In, um, in New Zealand, there was no fantasy rugby, right? And there was no fantasy cricket. So I had a couple of friends that were web developers and I went to them with the idea of fantasy rugby. So the first thing we did is we looked up the, you know, the uh, address, the name fantasyrugby.com and it was available. So we grabbed it. And I set about designing a statistical profile of the game of rugby. Wow which I did all on my own. And it, it was very um, uh, elementary, to be honest, you know, because I didn't know the game very well. My, my best friend, the best man at my wedding was an all black and, and uh, a, a great, great rugby player. And we, we love to talk sports. And so he taught me a bit and quite a bit about rugby. But by 2000, I had designed and developed this game and we had been running it for a couple of years and so I was just hanging out one day and I got a phone call and, and uh, the guy that called me said uh, Tab Baldwin I said yes he said this is Alan Pollock mm. he said I'm the assistant coach of North Harbor Rugby Union I said hi Alan how are you nice to hear from you and he said I'm very good he said and typical rugby guy you know not not a lot of um, graciousness not a lot of uh, <laughs> around the you know, very blunt. He said, uh, what is this thing called fantasyrugby.com? And I said, oh, you know, interesting question. I said, well, it's a, it's a, 
a rugby game played online based on a statistical profile of the game. He said, where did you get the statistical profile? I said, well, I did it. And he said, what do you know about rugby? And it was almost confrontational, the, the conversation. I remember it very clearly. And I said, frankly, I don't know a heck of a lot, but I know what a tackle is. I know what a turnover is. And I, I know what a line out take is. And, you know, <clears throat> and he said, uh, well, who does your stats? And I said, I do. And he said, you do your stats, your own stats. You watch the games. I said, yes, I watch every single rugby game every week. And he goes, well, that's 12 games a week. I said, that's correct. And he says, you watch and take a statistical profile of 12 games a week. I said, yes, that's correct. He goes, well, you do know something about rugby then. I said, well, I don't know. I, I mean, you could <laughs> tell me whether I know something or not. He goes, in fact, I want to do that. Will you come in and have a meeting with me? I said, of course. It was interesting to me. I said, sure, happy to. So I went over to the rugby club. We sat down very professional, you know, tremendous money in rugby in New Zealand. So everything's first class, first rate, beautiful offices, everything else. So I sit down and we, we just talk for probably an hour. And he really quizzes me. And at the end of it, he goes, you know, you know a bit, you know, you do know a bit. And I said, honestly, I don't know what I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not that well versed in the game. And he goes, well, you know a bit. And he said, I want to introduce you to our head coach. And their head coach was a guy named Buck Shelford. Buck Shelford is one of the all time legends of all black rugby. That would be like, that would be like taking a kid today and walking into Jaworski's office and say, you know, this is Mr. Jaworski, you know, and, and <laughs> he wants to hear what you think. Wow. You know? So I go in and, and I'm in awe of Buck Shelford, awe of him. And so Buck is even more brusque and, and dismissive than Alan Pollock was. Like, you know, he's the ultimate in no manners. You know, and it's like he's just come off the rugby field. He goes, who's this guy? And Pollock says, yeah, this is Tab Baldwin. He coaches the Auckland basketball team. Well, what's he doing here? And, well, I've just had a meeting with him, and he runs a website where he does rugby statistics, and I want you to talk to him. So we talked. <clears throat> Buck Shelford really didn't give a damn about statistics. He was not a high-tech guy. But he really believed in Alan Pollock. And Alan Pollock said, Buck, this guy will offer us something. So Buck goes, he doesn't even ask me about basketball. Not one question. He goes, okay, go do a contract with him. Give him a job and tell him to be on the field Monday. I was like, hold on. You know, well, I got basketball practice on Monday, you know. And... So that was it. We walked out of the office. We walked to the general manager's office and I'm like, are we seriously going to do this? And he goes, Hey, Buck wants you. So, you know, and I was thinking to myself, wow, how excited am I right now? Because I love rugby. And I thought to myself, I'm going to do this. You know, I don't really care. I'm going to do this. Wow. So I called, <laughs> I, I did the contract, did a contract, didn't even mention basketball, did a contract. $1,500 a month. That's what it was. Nothing, right? You know, and I, and I was the video analyst, assistant, sorry, assistant video analyst. So I walk over to, um, I, I leave the office, got the contract in my hand. I go immediately to the owners of the basketball team. I go in, I go, look at this guys. Cause they were good friends of mine. And they go, that's unbelievable. Good for you. I'm like, can I do both? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do both. So I was thrilled. I was on my way. I was on the rugby field Monday. I was out there kicking a rugby ball, which I'm terrible at. I was running around throwing passes. I, time of my life, Rick, time of my life. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to be a rugby coach and I'm going to be a good one. I'm going to be a good one. Three weeks later, I get a call from Basketball in New Zealand. A new CEO, Tab, we want you to be the new national coach. I said, no, too late. I said, that horse is bolted. 
no, no, we really do. We want you to apply us. Don't even mention apply. I will not apply for that job. So if you want to give it to me, give it to me. I said, otherwise, thank you, but no thank you. I am a rugby coach now. What? I'm on the North Harbor rugby coaching staff. And I said, that's, that's my future. Well, to make this, to, to finish this story, a lot of arm twisting. Uh, and finally they said, okay, you don't have to go through the application process. We will give you the job. We want you to be the national coach. So, you know, I gave up my rugby job and I was back to basketball. But for about six weeks, I was in heaven. As, but I don't think I ever would have been a good coach, to be honest. But, <laughs> but I, uh, I absolutely loved it. All right. So the rugby's loss is basketballs and the Philippines gain. <laughs> well, That's an amazing story, Coach. <laughs> All right. So we're, and on that note, we're moving back to basketball here on Cold Brew with Rick Olivares. It's now, now time to talk about the NBA. And I asked Coach Tab prior to the show to actually name his all-time NBA starting 12 and his coaching staff. We all know that he's a Boston Celtics fan. So I'm, gonna, I'm mighty interested to hear who's in his 12. All right, Coach? Floor is yours. Well, I, I, I did this for you and only for you because I usually don't partake in these sorts of things. But when I started doing it, it was a bit of fun. And, and then I took it really seriously. And then I was like, gosh, that's not the right pick. And, you know, it went back and forth. But anyway, Rick, here's my 12. <laughs> you know, to be torn apart by your followers. So point guard, I would have John Stockton. Um, shooting guard would be Michael Jordan. Small forward would be LeBron James. My power forward would be Tim Duncan. Uh, my center would be Bill Russell. Uh, my backup point guard would be Russell Westbrook. My backup shooting guard would be uh, Oscar Robertson. Uh, my backup three-man would be Scotty Pippen. My backup four-man would be Larry Bird. My backup center would be Hakeem Olajuwon. And I know who I just left out, all the centers, right? <laughs> By picking Russell and Hakeem, I know, you know, the lineup I left out. And then my 11th and 12th men would be Magic Johnson and Dennis Rodman. And I think... Um, I think that team would, uh, it might not be the best players position by position, but I don't think they would lose a game to anybody else's 12. Most definitely, and I agree with you. So before we dissect that a little further, who's on your coaching staff? I think I, you know, that, that was an interesting one. And, and um, maybe people thinking you know, he's a Celtics fan, he'll go Red Arbach. I, I, I wouldn't. I think... I don't think Red was a great X's and O's guys, but I think he managed his, his players in that era incredibly well. But I think when you've got Bill Russell there, you're cheating as a coach. I, I don't think it's fair. I think it's similar to, to my, me coaching the New Zealand team when I had Piro Cameron next to me. It, it, it's like too easy to coach when you've got that kind of person next to you. I'll tell you the guy I would have as my, my head coach. I would have Eric Spelstra. I think, wow. I think he is a magnificent basketball coach. And, wow. uh, and I think he's, again, proving his worth. Yes, he is. And if I could have three assistant coaches, I, I would spin it around on him. I'd have Pat Riley, who would be responsible for the culture and the chemistry, because I think he was phenomenal uh -huh. at that. I would have Brad Stevens as my X's and O's guy mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think that uh, I think he just does, you know, just a remarkable job of that. And I would have Jerry Sloan in charge of my defense. And, and wow. he just nips out Tom Thibodeau on that. And, uh, but I would have that as a coaching staff and I'd be pretty comfortable that they would, they would uh, work well together. I think they're all pretty humble individuals except for Pat Riley, but, Pat's so intelligent that he would know that that coaching staff would work well. And I think he'd work with Spelstra. Wow. And I think that staff would be pretty good. I agree. 
But very interesting choices. I'm curious. You said that you had to change over some of the names. Who was the 13th man in that team that you cut? <laughs> well, it, it pretty interesting. Um, it, it, was not, it was not so much a 13th man, although I will get to that. But it was, it was the point guard position that drove me crazy. You know, because right. how can you not have magic there? And then not have, how can you not have magic as the backup? But I thought having magic in the roster was an absolute, you know, because he could, he could do so <coughs> many things. Mm. And then the, the exact opposite of that was having a guy like Rodman there who, if, if you're ever having trouble in a game on the boards, which I think wins championships, you just put him in and you solve that problem. But for, for me, guys that I considered being in this team were Tiny Archibald, Carl Malone, and, um, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, they, they were guys that I thought it's, it's really hard to leave them out. And Shaquille, too. You know, I mean, certainly uh, all of those guys. And, but, you know, I mean, does Kobe belong there instead of Pippen? And he, the, the argument is unending. You know, and it's fun to have that with even okay. with yourself. You know, that's what sports all about, right? Yeah, you exactly. look at the All Star Game; someone's always left out. Exactly. Right. So, if that was difficult, the next starting twelve or maybe ten is when we go to the international game. So, coach has been around. So it's interesting. I asked him to name who is top ten international players. Those that he's seen. So I don't know what he, what he did. And I, and I limited myself here to um, players that, that I actually, in one way or another, coached against or, okay. or coached, right? Okay. So um, my point guard would be Sarunas Yaskovicius because mm -hmm. I, I think that he's just phenomenal. Um, my shooting guard would be Manu Ginobili. And mm. I had to leave uh, Drazen Petrovic off because, you know, I, I never crossed paths with him. Uh, mm. I had to leave Tony Kukoc off the team because I, I never crossed paths with those guys. So Ginobili would have been my shooting guard, but I put LeBron as my small forward because I coached against him in the international arena. Right. And I think he deserves to be there. Uh, Nowitzki would be my power forward, Dirk Nowitzki. Mm -hmm. Yao Ming would be my center. So that's a pretty impressive starting yeah, five. Yeah. Uh, the Amantides from Greece would be my yeah. backup point guard. Uh -huh. uh, this is a guy maybe a lot of people ever, haven't heard of, but I thought in his era, he was probably the best shooter of the basketball in the world at that time. And that's uh, Giancarlo Basili from mm -hmm. Italy. Yeah. A phenomenal shooter. Phenomenal. Uh, Dejan Bodoroga would be my uh, backup small forward. White Magic. So, what's that? The man they call White Magic. Correct. Correct. And a winner. And a winner. And he would always be on the floor at the end of a game, a tight game. I put my player, Piero Cameron, as the backup power forward. Mm -hmm. um, and he would be on the floor at the end of an important game as well. And I put Luis Scola as uh, the backup center. And I gave him the nod over Vladi Divac. Uh, because I think Scola was just incredible in the international game. I think Vlade was a great NBA player. And he was very good in the international game. But uh, the era that I coached most of my international basketball, Scola was, uh, he was just such a class act and, and such a great player and such a smart player. Mm -hmm. So that was my 10. And, uh, um, you know, again, Many players debatable in there, and you know a lot of people would have their own say. Right, right. Was which one was harder to craft or put together, the NBA or the international basketball team? NBA, I think. Uh, I think uh, because I knew more having, you know, watched it my whole life. You know, so when you go all the way back to the '60s, mm -hmm. and you go all the way through the 2000s. I mean, Russell Westbrook, I think, is the only player. Russell and LeBron are the only current players, you know, still playing, I believe, on my roster. So it covers span such a gigantic time, whereas the international really, 
you know, I think all of those players would have played between 2000 and 2010. You know? Right, right. Before we leave this, the international basketball arena, I'd like to ask you, and I forgive me for not um, telling you about this earlier. What about the international game do you love? And what's a good anecdote to share that sums up your having coached practically all over the world? What I love about the international game is the elitism of it. Um, and, and the pride associated uh, with the players. I, I remember um, coaching the Philippines against, I believe it was either Saudi or Syria. Mm. And I remember that, that uh, we almost had a fight because you know, those players were, were dying for their country, you know, and it didn't matter that they were, a, you know, a flea on the international basketball map. And I've coached, you know, several teams that have, you know, had no business walking on the court in many games with any sense of pride, like, you know, we're going to go out and compete today. And yet every one of them did. And I don't think that was something that I instilled in them. I think that was, you know, their pride in, in wearing their nation's colors. Right. That's a phenomenal environment to coach in. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, to be honest, it isn't there every day in practice, mm -hmm. although we would try to drum it out of the players mm -hmm. and talk about that. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly there most of the time. And the actual tournaments themselves – I think they're a little watered down now. I, I remember the 02 tournament. I remember the 2011 tournament with Jordan, mm -hmm. you know, getting to the, to the semifinals and, and the finals in, in 11, you know, we had to play nine games in 11 days. Wow. You know, you're, you're a warrior right. to be able to go through that. Mm -hmm. You're a warrior. And, you know, that's what it was like. You, you know, you, you had to prepare psychologically for those tournaments and and of course you know you, you walk out on the court as a coach and you look down at the other bench and there's Zelko Bradovic or Svetislav Pesic or right. you know uh Carl um I can't even think George Carl or, you know and Larry Brown uh, I mean you know the guys that I've looked down there and seen and coaching against uh, many of our fans here may not know some of the names, but I certainly knew them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was in awe of some of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, so you asked for an anecdote. Probably one of the most memorable anecdotes would involve Zelko Obradovich, who, who I believe is the best basketball coach in the world today. Mm -hmm. And it's the 2004 Olympics, and we played against them. And it was the only game we won at the Olympics, but we played – extraordinary basketball as the New Zealand team at the Olympics. We lost to Spain and Argentina by four points. We lost right. to Italy who won the silver medal by two. So we had quite a, an unbelievable tournament, uh, but we beat uh, Serbia and, and we scored with just a few seconds to go. And then they had a last second shot and, and missed it. And so at the press conference after the game, I, here's a guy I'm in awe of, right? And, He's beat red. If you've ever seen Coach Obradovich get upset, yeah. he goes the brightest red of any human I think I've ever seen. <laughs> and he's still bright red at the press conference after the game. <laughs> in, in those days, you had a moderator and the two coaches and a player from each team. And the moderator would say to the losing coach, Coach, can you give us a recap of the game? And then he would say to the – in fact, he would say to the players first. Yeah. And then he would allow them to leave. And then he would say to the losing coach, coach, can you give us your recap of the game? Yeah. And he was, I think he was shaking. He was so angry. And I think he was angry at his team. He was angry that he had to be there. Who knows what else he was angry at? He's Serbian. He could have been angry at anything. He could have been angry at the water. You know, I, the Serbs are just like that. So, what does he say, right? You know, he comes right out 
this uh, this New Zealand team. This uh, and he looks at me. You know, he has the audacity. These guys are unbelievable. The Serbs and I love Coach Obradovich. We're friends now. He looks at directly at me, and I'm looking at him like, "What are you going to say?" He looks directly at me. These uh, these New Zealand guys. They uh, they they. These rugby players, they dirtiest player, dirtiest team in the world. This guy, dirtiest coach in the world. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And so, of course, inside me, I'm swelling with pride, right? You know, I mean, I could have taken offense, but I'm thinking this is the greatest compliment I've ever had coming from Coach Bradovich. He's just called me the dirtiest coach in the world. And... Um, and that's it. And he, and he says, I, I, I have no talk. I don't talk to this team. This guy is so dirty, these guys. And I'm almost laughing, but I'm, I'm, you know, holding it inside and I'm trying to think, you know, what is my witty retort to this? You know, because I'm not going to let him. I won the game. I'm coming out of this press conference, you know, on top. And so, you know, any questions for Coach Obradovich? A couple of people ask questions and he, he dismissed them. Uh, this, this is a stupid question. Uh, these, these guys, you know, this, this game is not a good game. This game like rugby. You know, my players, we cannot play this basketball. And so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy and sitting there, you know. And, and uh, so they finish. And then, Coach Baldwin, would you like to have your say? And I said, yes. Um, <clears throat> I said, I was really proud of our team. You know, we fought to the end and, and uh, we, we managed to, to get a great win. And, uh, you know, we need to win the next game. And I went right into that, you know, right into the next game. Didn't mention what he said. And one of the reporters from New Zealand is a good friend of mine, and he's laughing. He's out there and he's laughing. And so I know that he's coming back to this. Right? So I, I finish and the moderator says, and Coach Obradovich is still there. And the moderator says, uh, he says, um, okay, any questions? So Mark Hinton raises his hand. And Yes, uh, reporter from New Zealand. Uh, Tab, um, Coach Bradovich said your team's the dirtiest team in the world, and he called you the dirtiest coach in the world. Uh, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, Mark, you know, um, we do play physical basketball in New Zealand. I said, but um, I, guess, I guess when you lose, and then I look directly at Coach Bradovich. I said, I guess when you lose, and I looked at him, I said, I guess any excuse will do like that. And I left it at that. I think he went purple. I, you know, <laughs> I don't think he breathed. I don't think anything. And at that time, I didn't know him. About two years later, I was hired to coach in Greece, and he was coaching at that time Panathinaikos in Greece and winning every EuroLeague. And there was a preseason uh, coaches banquet and press conference. So I go in there and, you know, I'm already, you know, ducking. I don't even want to see him, you know. He comes straight up to me. He goes, oh, this guy, huh? This guy. And I'm like, Coach Obradovich, how are you? And he goes, oh, this guy. He goes, this dirty guy. I said, I said, look, Coach. He goes, and he starts laughing. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, I was too pissed off after that game he goes you made great game you made great team uh, you deserve that game and he said but but when you come Panathinaikos I kick your ass <laughs> <laughs> so you know that was the start of a, a, a friendship that uh, I, I treasure you know we don't say <laughs> much but I treasure to this day all right since we're on the topic of rugby and dirty players have you ever done the haka? <laughs> you put me on the spot, Rick. <laughs> badly one time. Oh. Uh, badly. Is it on YouTube, Coach? No. <laughs> no. no. It, is, it is nowhere on any uh, electronic device. Um, at the Olympics, uh, we did the haka to greet every gold medalist when they came back to the village. Uh, and the entire New Zealand Olympic team did the haka. Well, I always stayed out of it. You know, I, 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 didn't, I knew how to do it, but I, I stayed out of it. Um, 
and I didn't believe it was my place, both as a coach and, and you know, really as a co-opted American. Well, after, after we finished the tournament, um, the players had a kangaroo court. I don't know if you know what a kangaroo yes, court I do. is. I do. Yeah. Or our listeners maybe don't know, but it's, it's where the judge becomes the judged, you know, and so everybody, for any mistake that they made during the whole time that we were together, they were judged and given a penalty. Right. A lot of times the penalty had to do with alcohol and I don't drink. So, and I told them I will never, you know, drink anything as a penalty, you know, because I just, I don't drink. So they of course brought up the fact that I was a very, very poor teammate because as all these gold medalists came back to the village and everybody did the haka, I didn't do any haka. So I was a bad guy. I was a bad teammate. You know, I was a bad New Zealander. <laughs> and of course I was being, you know, beat up terribly by all of the players and they were having a lot of fun with me. And so when it came time for my penalty, they said, um, so we think it's only appropriate now since you, you obviously know how to do the haka, but you don't, you know, you think you're too good to do it. We think it's appropriate that we now go out in the middle of the Olympic village and we're all going to go out there and we're going to watch you do the haka in front of whoever happens to be there. <laughs> so, son of a gun, you know, they, they walk me right out <laughs> of the middle of the, the open space and there's hundreds of people walking around and they're making all kinds of commotion, you know, to draw attention. And so then they say, okay, you know, um, let's go do the haka. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think I did probably the worst haka. I was the most embarrassed individual. I, I wanted to crawl under every rock as fast as I could and get back into the room where we were having our kangaroo court. Uh, and, and I kind of wished I drank at that point, but, you know, so that's my only Hakka experience. And I, I think I'll take that one to my grave, Rick. You're actually lucky, co Coach, because that was before the era of cell phones with cameras, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But th don't, don't worry, they had many cams in those days, but the kangaroo court bans all of that. So everybody was safe. All right. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, we have a few more topics here in cold brew. The next one is, um, I have to ask you this, Coach. Given your experience, you've experienced a lot of uh, championships, a lot of highs, but there are also the lows. And I asked you to name your most memorable triumphs and your most painful losses, and why. There's no number. Just share what you can. Well, triumphs were pretty easy. Um, I think uh, the, the one that's the number one at the top was when we beat, uh, when New Zealand beat Australia in 2001 in the series, two games to, two games to one, best of three series to, to qualify for the Olympics. Beating never been done before. New Zealand had only ever beaten Australia in one game in 1978. They'd never had another victory against Australian basketball. And then we beat them two out of three games in 2001 to win the series and qualify for the world championships for the first time. So that was extraordinary. That was a gold medal in Oceania. Uh, terribly exciting. Um, terribly fulfilling. Uh, and, you know, I just, I can't, I can't describe what a great feeling that was, especially for, you know, a rookie international coach as well. Um, and uh, never experienced anything like that since. Uh, probably the games that come close would be uh, beating Puerto Rico in the quarterfinals of 2002 World Champs, um, which, which put us into the medal round, which put us into the final four. That was a great win. Uh, and the two times that uh, I coached uh, Jordan and the Philippines and beating Iran, uh, and moving, you know, advancing into the medal rounds of the Asia, FIBA Asia Championships. You know, those, 
those victories were, you know, watershed moments uh, for the teams I was coaching and for my career. Mm -hmm. And uh, were a lot of fun. Uh, right. Probably defeats. Uh, you know, um, it was tough to lose to Palestine in the opening game of the 2015 FIBA Asia, but I didn't take that too hard because I knew that the tournament was still in front of us and I knew there was, you know, time for redemption and, and we had to, you know, we had to get busy. Right. Um, one that may interest you <clears throat> with my Auckland basketball team we won the 1995, 96, 97 NBL championships. We came into 98. We were the best team. Uh, we were looking to get a fourth win. And we lost in the semifinals. And um, I was stunned uh, losing that game. And, and um, I was angry, you know. And, and usually at the end of a season as a coach, you shake everybody's hands and, you know, you thank them for the season. And, and, uh, you know, you just, you just accept it and move on and, you know, start thinking about next year. Right. I had a hard time walking in that, that dugout after that game. And I was angry, very, very angry. And when I walked in that dugout, I said to the team, I said, uh, I will be coaching this team next year. I said, but several of you will not be in this team next year wow. because of your performance today. I said it was intolerable to me today for us to lose this basketball game. And I hold you accountable. And yes, I hold myself accountable, but wow. I hold some of you in particular accountable because you didn't do the work necessary right. to achieve what we are supposed to achieve. And I walked out. And I don't think I did the right thing. You know, I, I don't think that was the right thing to do. It was honest. <laughs> it was, uh, it didn't have a lot of tact associated with it, but it was honest. And several of those players were not in that team next year. And then we went on and won two more consecutive championships. But that's an indication of the kind of, I guess, uncompromising competitor that I was in those days. And I learned, you know, I learned more tact, more appropriate behavior. But that loss was as tough a loss as I think I ever experienced. And, um, you know, I probably handled it worse than any other loss I ever had. Right. So there you have it, uh, coaches, uh, Coach Tab's most memorable triumphs and most painful losses. We have a couple of more topics. We've got one more list. Coach, name your favorite sports films and why are they on your list? Oh, it's, actually I have a huge list, so I don't know how much why is gonna be there. I think for the most part, it's probably self-explanatory. But I, I did a, a short list of comedy ones because I can't mix comedy and drama sports because I love sports movies. So right. I, I think the top five funniest sports movies I ever saw, and I highly recommend them all. Number one is Slapshot, mm. a hockey movie. Yep. I laughed until Newman. I cried. Paul Newman. Yeah, I mean, I laughed until I cried watching that movie in several occasions. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of Talladega Nights. I, I, I think that the scene where they're saying grace at the table, I, I just still sometimes I just put it on, fast forward and just watch that scene. I just laugh so hard at that scene. I think Bad News Bears, because I remember I was young when I watched that. Yeah. And Walter Matthau was just fantastic in that movie. Yeah. And, it was a great movie about kids, and it was a lot of laughter in that movie. Definitely, yeah. I'm a big Kevin Costner fan, and Bull Durham, I think, is a, is a great, you know, it crosses. It's romantic, and it's comedy, and, you know, it, it's a great, uh, a great, great uh, sports movie. And then, of course, Major League. I, you know, that, 
Charlie that, that is, uh, yeah, Charlie Sheen and and just extremely well written movie uh-huh. and very well cast and you know the the characters were great. But my other list, you know, is is uh, again it's got Kevin Costner all over it, but <clears throat> I think Field of Dreams is one of my favorite movies of all time, not just sports movies. I, I really a love it. Film. Such uh, a beautiful film. Yeah, yeah. And I love baseball movies in particular, yeah. but uh, Field of Dreams is a great one. Remember the Titans, fantastic yeah. movie. Denzel Washington, was, you know, spectacular. And the message in that one, you know, going to Gettysburg, you know, spine tingling stuff. And uh, true story, too. I, I thought that was uh, spectacular. Right. On any given Sunday, great movie, great acting, great drama, uh, great cinematography. You know, the guy's eye comes out. You know, some some really uh, graphic stuff about football and and yeah. uh, very well acted. Um, here's one that uh, a lot of people won't know, but it was one of my favorites. Uh, and I'm a sucker for. Uh, you know, I cry during a lot of movies. I'm a sucker for tough stories. But Brian's song. Brian's song. About Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayers and the relationship yeah. they had. And, and it's a Talk movie I think everybody should watch now, especially today. Yep. You know, the bond they had, the, yep. the sacrifices they made for one another. Uh, I, I could start crying right now. You know, I, I, I cried too when I saw that, Coach. You can't not. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's just an awesome, awesome movie and an awesome story. And it's a true story. It's a true story. And it is very close to the truth from what I've read. Right. The Natural, you know, Robert Redford, Robert Redford baseball yeah. movie. I love that, you know, the, the underdog guy, you know, I just love that. Yeah, yeah. I love Cinderella Man, you know, <laughs> Russell Crowe, and, and that's a true story. And, and uh, uh, what a wonderful story about overcoming phenomenal odds. Uh, mm-hmm. I love Friday Night Lights. Uh, again, great story about what's going on today, you know, how we are challenged by issues like racism and we are challenged by so many issues that require us to go outside of ourselves and develop sporting chemistry, which then we turn around and it translates back into society. And I wish we were doing that more today. I wish our athletes were saying, look at us bond as athletes and meaning we can bond as people, you know irrespective of the challenges that we have in society. You know, Friday Night Lights was a great example of that. If I may, Coach, what, another thing, I, what, what I loved about that film was the Permian Panthers didn't even win. They lost. That's right. That's right. And that's, I, I've written a couple of sports books locally, mm-hmm. and um, sometimes I want to write about a certain team, and they say, well, we lost. They said, is everything about winning? It's the journey sometimes. It's what you learn from that and how you bounce back. It's the story. It's, it's a story. story. And, every, and not every story in the real world is a happy ending. Exactly. You know, that doesn't mean it doesn't have great value and there aren't phenomenal lessons to be taken. Right. From it. Did you ever follow the TV series, Coach? Friday Night Lights? A little bit, but not, you know, I never got caught up in it. But I did a little bit. Yeah. Right. Um, so 10 Cup. You know, Kevin Costner, that, and that, you know, that's got some great moments in it. Uh, yeah. Hoosiers has to be on my list, you know. Uh, Gene Hackman. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and then Moneyball. Uh, I thought, great movie, you know, Brad Pitt. And, and a movie that had an impact on me, to be honest, because it, it made me even think more seriously about analytics. Um, and what I needed to, you know, go further into that in basketball. And so I've become dedicated. You know, I'm a dedicated analytics guy in, in my coaching today. And well, you were, into, you were into analytics when you were in rugby, right, Coach? A different kind, yes. But, yes, that's, that's exactly, you know, what it was all about. It was all about uh, – but, you know, analytics is more taking the stats and, and telling the, uh, the story beneath the surface of the stats. Right, right, right. Okay, there's a reason why Coach is, uh, for our very last topic, there's a reason why he's wearing that shirt. And I'm actually going to have to put on the shirt. If you put on a Yankee shirt, I tell you what, I, I'm pushing the delete button. 
<laughs> oh, God bless you, Rick. I got to rep my Yankees, Coach. God bless you. Okay. Coach is from Jacksonville, FLA, and that is... Sorry, sorry let me interrupt you. When's the last time the Yankees won a World Series? 2009. No. <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to clarify that. We've run three since then. That's okay. I just, I wasn't no. sure. I have no comments about crediting the Red Sox because they've come a long way. They're one of the model organizations. They win it every other year. And I was surprised they're at the bottom right now because I was expecting them to bounce back this year, this season. So, but maybe it's the pandemic. Maybe there are a lot of factors, but you know, that's a class organization. I'm going to give you that. It's a class organization. John Henry knows how to run a baseball team. Yes, he and does. He also manages my favorite football team. He owns it, Liverpool. So that's he's won with two teams that are red. So you got to give props and, you know, I'm not one of those guys like who'll say like oh, screw the Red Sox and all that. You, you gotta give the props where it's there. Phenomenal baseball, you know. You know, but there it is, coach. But interesting. You're from Jacksonville. That's football country right there. Very much. How does a Florida man find himself rooting for Boston teams? Well, I, live, I lived in New York, so I rooted for the New York teams. Right. Well, I think you opened our, our podcast today talking about, you know, what I do in the morning. And, and am I a sports fan? Am I, you know, enamored with all sports? As a kid growing up, I, I love sports. And I was always into stats. So, you know, baseball was big for me. And um, <clears throat> there was no, you know, I had five older, four older brothers. And so, you know, Everybody, Pittsburgh Pirates, you know, Chicago Cubs. My dad was a Chicago Cubs fan, Chicago White Sox in my household. There was never, you know, we didn't all fall in behind one team. And there were no Florida teams at that time. There was no Marlins and, and uh, Devil Rays at that time. So, you know, you had to go outside. And right. um, I, I just you know, m one of my earliest memories is Carl Yastrzemski and his batting style. Yes, yes. You know, he held the bat way up here. And I, I don't know why. So I just thought that was cool. And yeah. because I thought that was cool, I thought the Red Sox were cool. And I loved the Green Monster. I just loved the character of, you know, a guy like Rico Petroselli could have value to your team as a 225 hitter, but he's going to hit 34 home runs and 28 of them are going to be at home in Fenway and he can't hit on the road and he can't hit home runs on the road, but, and he's not that good a third baseman, but you've got to have him in your, in your lineup because at Fenway, he's going to hit it out of the park. You know, there's a good chance. So just those little things. And, and uh, I, you know, there's no real connection other than that, other than Carl Yastrzemski, who's my all time favorite athlete. And, uh, you know, just the, the heartbreak, another underdog story for me, you know, the, the Red Sox had it once since 1918 and the curse of the Bambino and, you and know, all of that, I, was just, I was just drawn to that, you know, and then later on, Bill Buckner was my favorite player, you know, so hard luck kid. And my brothers give me a hard time. Said, Why do you pick so many losers? I'm like, hold on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's the reason. But I am a avid, voracious Red Sox fan. Do you remember the first time you went to Fenway? Of course. What, what, describe the magic of being in that grand old ballpark. And do you still feel the same way every time you go? Well, I've only been twice, and, and they were in consecutive days. Okay. And the first time I was there, you know, here we go again. Just like in 2004, when we won the World Series, the first time I was there, I cried. In 2004, when we won the World Series, I cried. You know, and why? Why? You know, I, I don't have anything to do with baseball. You know, that's, that's what it means to be. That's why I can understand Gila's fans. That's why I can understand, you know, fans who are so passionate. You know, because I feel that for the Red Sox. And I don't know, they are just in my blood. And the first time I went there, you know, I just literally had chill bumps up and down. I stood there in the, in the you know, the foyer 
and and it's not it wasn't a nice stadium you know in those days they fixed it up now but it was it was a real old ballpark mm -hmm. you know and i just stood there and absorbed the history but and that's part of it right that's part of the magic the old play it being old but there are a lot of ghosts in that place good ones Absolutely. Bad memories too, but it's part of the mystique. Absolutely. You know, and I, I walked around the park. I walked around the outside. I walked, walked around Yawkey Way, you know, and I went in and I walked through the, the lobby areas, you know, past the concession stands. And I went in and bought merchandise and I went in the stadium. I went down and I touched Pesky's pole. I went down and I touched the green monster. You know, what can I say? You know, it, it's, it's, as an individual, it shouldn't affect anybody else this way, although it does thousands and thousands of Red Sox fans. Mm. It's an individual thing and it is in my blood. I am that much of a Red Sox fan. And I don't follow any other Facebook pages. I follow the Red Sox fan Facebook page. That's it. It's in my blood. Was it everything that you expected it to be as a and kid? More. Oh, wow. And more. Yeah, and more. I didn't know what it would be. I thought I'd be cool, you know, go in, get a t-shirt, you know, and go in and sit and watch a game and think, oh, this is really cool. Man, it really just, <clears throat> and this was before 04 too, <clears throat> before we won the World Series. Right, right. So, you know, this was still the curse. This was still the heartache. Mm. And I just love it. And I can go back in my wardrobe here i probably have 15 20 red Sox shirts and probably 10 red Sox hats mm -hmm. i don't wear them that often but you know when i do every time i put one on i feel it i feel that's my team right 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 and i think that that's cool are you able to watch your games nowadays i don't watch them currently um they need to stand for the national anthem. I love my country more than I love the Red Sox. Mm. Uh, but um, if I could, I would. If I if I could, yeah. But I can't right now. Right, right. But you told me about your relationship with your dad, who also got you into sports. Yeah. Can you share about baseball? Did you ever play catch with your dad? What's it like? Because, you know, they, growing up, baseball was my first sport because of my grandfather. My grandfather was in the U.S. Army, and he would bring me these Life magazines and show me Mickey Mantle because he was a fan of the Mick. And that's how I became a Yankee fan. It was transplanted. But there was some magic about playing catch with your grandfather. Can you talk? Talk about that, your relationship with your dad, because I know you guys, there was that, even with your brothers, there was that, I remember when your brother passed away and my condolences, uh, you, you, you spoke about it, even your love for sports and all that, all of you. Can you, can you talk about your, your dad? Well, my dad was, um, was an extraordinary individual, uh, and that would be the last thing he would say. Uh, he's probably the humblest person I ever knew. Um, he would be one of the best coaches in any sport that I ever knew. He certainly was the most demanding person in my life. Um, uh, so many times he demanded more than I was capable of giving and was unrelenting and pushing me to my limits. Mm. <clears throat> I felt sorry for myself. My mom felt sorry for me. Even my brothers felt sorry for me as I felt sorry for them when I saw what he did to them. Uh, but I love my dad, you know, immensely. Mm. I respected him immensely, but we were never friends. Oh, I'm never friends. Wasn't. And that was his call. My dad felt that his job in life was to teach me to be a good person a good Catholic and provide me with the tools to be a successful man. 
And that didn't include being my friend. I had other friends. I had brothers. Dad, many times I shot basketballs with dad. And I can remember on only a few occasions, you know, throwing a, a baseball or a softball back and forth. But dad was, dad was stuck pretty much to basketball. Mm. Um, he he was a coach. Sorry? He was a coach. He was my coach, yes. Right. He didn't coach uh, other sports. Um, he loved baseball. You know, he loved to watch the Cubs. Uh, but, you know, his, my, my dad was a very basic man. I won't call him simple, but he was basic. His, his life was very ordered. He was a man, a creature of habit incredibly disciplined man. My dad smoked cigarettes until 1955 when he saw, uh, I can't think of the actor's name now on TV. He saw him smoking a cigarette and he said, I don't think that looks good. He took his cigarette, he put it out and he never smoked again. That was my dad. That was how he was. Uh, he was a military man. Um, most of my brothers were military men. Uh, hence the patriotism in our house. And, um, but the, the memories I have with my dad are playing for him and him coaching me and how tough he was mm. and how much gratitude I have to him. Not at that moment. Mm. I, I hated it many times. But how much gratitude I had at that moment, uh, I'm sorry, how much gratitude I had later in life for him pushing me as hard as he did. And the fact that I can be tough as a coach, I attribute that to him. Mm -hmm. So I would say that any player that has played for me and has felt that the fact that I was tough on them and that they would look back and thank me, I would immediately redirect that to my father because he taught me that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Two more questions, coach. I'm sorry. No problem. If, Fine. What, what's okay. Uh, baseball obviously is the national pastime of the United States of America. Um, what do you think of the state of the game? Let's, let's remove all the politicking and all that. What do you think of a lot more homers are being bashed out of the park into the stands, you know, oh, What's up? What do you think of the game today? Is it more exciting? I think it is. I think the game's as exciting as it ever, you know, has been. I think the athleticism of the game is remarkable when you see these outfielders, you know, running down long flies and jumping over the fence and, you know, stealing home runs and, and you know, batters still hitting, you know, hitting tape measure home runs. But still, the, the batting averages aren't changing very much. It's still the hardest thing to do in sport is hit a round ball with a round stick, you know, and you don't see anybody batting 400. Uh, but what you do see is you see athleticism um, coming. I don't like the shifts. I don't like that so much. I don't like uh, the platooning of pitchers. Mm. Now, you know, pitchers, they don't let them go, you know, over 100 pitches. And yeah. I understand it, though. Yeah. And I understand that science has a place and, and, you know, they're, they're really helping the players. But I, I think it, you know, it casts the record book into, I, I think they should close the record book and start a new one, you know, because there are some fundamental elements of the game that, that are different now. But it's also interesting, you know, that as we see athletes who are bigger, stronger, faster, we see they don't steal bases anymore. And yet they're probably more capable mm -hmm. of stealing bases. Mm -hmm. But this is where the analytics and the, and the stats have entered. And, and they just say, you know, no, they don't, don't do it. You're wasting outs. You don't need to do that. And, right, right. You know, advance the runners, get your, your walks and you know, money ball. And so I think it's interesting the way the game is evolving. I think it's just as exciting. Mm -hmm. I think they make extraordinary plays in the infield and outfield and defensive plays and I think the hitters are as good as they've ever been I hope you don't mind coach but I'm going to go back to something you said earlier like pitch counts if you recall Pedro Martinez if he goes past a certain number people start 
teeing off him. And one time they left him on the field a little bit longer and the Yankees just knocked him out. And I think there was a fight during that game. And um, yeah, but I, I, I agree. Sometimes you got to go with your gut and let them play. But I think in the case of Pedro, you know, the numbers just go down after a while. So, you know, and had they do that for, for a lot of pitchers. But I think, I think no longer do we, do we see managers even testing that. I think Verlander threw a complete game last year, and it might have been one of yeah. yeah. a few. You know, and yeah. his pitch count went up to something like 119, something yeah. like that. You know, and, and everybody was talking, oh, you know, is, are they risking his shoulder? Are they, mm-hmm. you know, come on, you're not. You know, I mean, you're not any more than he could throw up his 77th pitch and, and throw his, you know, arm out, he could, you know, jar his elbow, get a Tommy John injury, you know. Any of that can happen. But they're just playing the percentages more. And baseball has always been a game of percentages. So who can blame them? The last question about baseball before we end this whole thing. Is there any stat from any other sport that you're introducing into your basketball that you're borrowing and maybe in Ateneo you're using this particular stat? Like, you want to look into this? Um, there probably is Rick, but off the top of my head, cause I, I do like to steal from, you know, other stats. I, I can say that in, in general, my devotion to increased analytics and learning more and more and more comes from baseball it comes from, uh, Billy Bean and, and, you know, what he did with the Oakland A's and, and that's in the movie Moneyball. <clears throat> but I, I can't say that, you know, um, uh, well, I, I can tell you, uh, you know, it, it's probably letting a little bit of the, you know, the cat out of the bag. You should, maybe you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> I, I've become preoccupied with defense over the last several years. Right. And, um, you know, I, I really think that it's a, a great thing to teach young players. And I, I think it's a, a great element in winning basketball. And we, we, and our coaching staff, we've looked at the percentages of, of what happens based on where the basketball goes on the floor, mm-hmm. you know, and, and how do your opponent's percentages go up and down based on where the ball goes. And, and so uh, we, we now know that when the ball goes to the middle of the floor, um, you know, teams are uh, incrementally more efficient offensively. And so if you keep the ball out of the middle of the floor, and that's not earth shattering news for anybody, but if you keep the ball out of the middle of the floor, opposing teams are incrementally less efficient. Now, how you do that, I'm not going to go into that and all the drills and everything else, but um, you know, that's an example of something like, you know, now baseball teams are, are putting the shift on for so many players. And you look at that and you say, yeah, well, you know, why don't you just bunt it down the third base line? And, but their managers are telling them, no, hit through the shift. It's still more efficient for you to try and do that than change your swing, change your approach, and, you know, try and hit to the opposite field. I hope, or I hope the people listening understand, because I know you do, what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a similar side of thing. You know, you, it's a similar sort of thing is, you know, when do you go with the percentages and change your tactics? And when do you just say to hell with the percentages and go with your, your, your skill set, your strengths? And maybe you're going through the teeth of your opponent. And, and that's when it becomes very interesting. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, we've clocked an hour and 40 minutes. I've got time for one more question. I should have asked you this earlier. If there were an actor to play you, who would it be? That's very difficult to say. Um, I mean, I could say Brad Pitt because we look so much alike. You know, I mean, that that goes without saying. Um, right. <laughs> but he's probably not as tough as I am. I, I don't know, Ricky. <laughs> you really put me on the spot here with this. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know. I, I like I like the way Pacino was in, in on any given Sunday. I thought he pulled off the, 
the demeanor of a coach, although I don't think I kind of am like that, but, you know, he did a good job pulling that off. Uh, but he's an intense actor, coach. He's very intense. Yeah, he's you know, intense. I love him that way. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say, you know, who that might be. Let's leave it at Brad Pitt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Let's just go with the doppelganger and leave it at that and, and uh, be happy about that. All right. Um, what's next for Ateneo basketball? I know that there's no – they're saying it's probably next year, around January, thereabouts, but um, – well, we're hoping to get on the court to train, you know, as soon as the IATF uh, and whoever else of the governmental agencies uh, is going to come up with the guidelines. Yeah. You know, but we have to wait. We have to be. Of course. Um, uh, we have to be careful. You know, right, right, right. And, uh, we have to make sure that we set a good example for other people when we do get on. Uh, we just have to do things the right way. And, right, right, right. And just keep praying. You know, that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I've been praying a lot that this coronavirus acts like SARS and all of a sudden just disappears, you know, and we don't have to deal with it again. Um, but God has a plan and uh, we have a plan, you know, as soon as we're able to, we're going to get back to work and, and uh, you know, just pray that, that all of us can be safe and can get back to our normal lives as soon as possible. Right. And then our players can, you know, go back to trying to fulfill their dreams and, and their, poten their potential. And, and, uh, and the average man on the street can get back to work and, yeah. and take care of himself and his family the way that I know that, that we all want to. Well said. Coach, it's been an entertaining an hour and 43 minutes. Uh, I hope that the people watching this podcast will see a different side of Coach. I hope that you were able to hear stories that are even aspects of coach that you've never heard before. And in my many, many conversations with this man, it's always fun. I always just have fun talking to coach and coach Tab, I want to thank you for taking the time to appear in my show called brew. I really appreciate you. And I want to thank you for everything you've done for my alma mater, our alma mater. And we hope that we can win more. I'm being biased right now, but I hope we can win a few more. <laughs> Well, Rick, let me say, let me say, Rick, that um, you know we talked a little bit before the podcast, and um, I didn't know how much I would really want to, you know, give a different persona than than the professional persona that that's my job to give. But I thought about it, and I thought in this time, you know, we're all a little bit different. You know, we're all being asked to be a little bit different as people. And um, yeah, I'm not the same guy at work as I am at home. And it's not my goal to let everybody into my private life, but I, I want to say thank you to you for disarming me a little bit and telling me that it would be okay. And that, you know, uh, I didn't have to, you know, be so tight laced and, and you know, I could, I could, euphemistically let my hair down because I, I literally can't <laughs> and, um, and have some fun. And I hope that the people that watch you and I understand that this is a couple of guys that love sports, that love Ateneo and we're talking, we're just, we're just talking and we're letting some people in on, on the inside to enjoy our time together and, and understand that we're just trying to enjoy each other's company. And, um, I hope we can leave it at that. I, I certainly didn't want to say anything to offend anybody today. I didn't want to say anything I, to I be out of so. bounds. And you helped me with that. Right, um, right. I appreciate you, Rick. And uh, well, Thank you, Coach. You know, when I first met you, when you joined Gilas, it was at Moro Lorenzo. And, of course, I knew who you were. And I was surprised you came up to me and you shook my hand. And I said, whoa. Then I think you knew me already. And... Uh, I was stunned because like, wow, you know, I, I was just like, wow. And ever since, even when, you know, whether it's coaching Batangilas or wh wherever, you've always granted, given me that, that time. Always. You've never denied me any interview, nothing. You've always been candid with, with 
everything, even when you did not agree with what I was saying, you'd be, you'd tell me right to my face. And I appreciated that. I always appreciated everything. And, um, you know, well, Rick, uh, if, if I could, if I could close up saying, you know, something to all the listeners out there and everybody that will listen to this, um, you're a hell of a good guy, Rick, and you're a very good journalist and I respect you and we're friends. So I like you. Thank you, coach. The things that you have the opportunity to say about me, I appreciate the things that other people say, you know, whether it's flattering or not, they, they depict a person that the vast majority of the time I'm not. The vast majority of the time, I'm a pretty simple guy. I'm, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. I don't think I'm extraordinary. I don't think I'm special. I think I'm a person that's been blessed with a good family, a good upbringing, a good work ethic. And the ball has bounced right for me far more than it has bounced wrong. And I've been fortunate in that sense. So I feel I'm compelled more to try and live up to the opportunities that I've had than play them down. So really, and to everybody out there and to you, Rick, you're just listening to a regular guy. I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. I'm a basketball coach. I'm a, a friend, a father, you know, and I, I just want to do good by other people. Well, I think you are, Coach. I think you are. So, Coach, I want to thank you for the time that you've given. I really appreciate it that you're – I haven't done podcasting in a while. I used to do it with Coach Ariel Van Guardia, but I started teaching, going back to teaching. You're, so you're my first guest, and I'm quite happy and really was ecstatic that you're my first guest on my return to podcasting. Coach, thank you so much. I wish you all the best, and uh, I hope that you and your loved ones are safe at this time. And I'll always be there to support you, Coach. You know that. Thank gotcha. you, Rick. Got gotcha. your thanks, you. Coach. God bless your family, particularly your father. I, I hope he stays in good health. Thanks, and Coach. I told my dad about it, that you always ask about him. Well. And he said, oh, now you're pulling my leg. I said, no. Coach asks you about you all the time. Probably even more than about me. <laughs> you know, I know that how much he matters to you. And you matter to me. So it's important. So All right. God bless you, Rick. Thank you so much. God bless you too. All Stay right. Safe. All right. To everyone watching, thank you. And we'll see you in the next episode. Night, coach. Stay safe. Good night, Rick. Bye-bye.